You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Good morning, good morning, good morning out there. I want to start with this thought. People who wonder if the glass is half empty or half full miss the point. The glass is refillable. I love that. And that quote is attributed to an uh, unknown. People who wonder if the glass is half empty or half full miss the point. The glass is refillable. And I apologize. Hopefully you guys don't hear this clicking noise. There is this clicking noise on the line for me. And I'm, we're waiting for our guests to join today's show. Hopefully they will be joining soon. Uh, 16 years in, I never know what's going to happen. Generally things go smoothly, but every now and then something doesn't go the way it's planned. We do have a wonderful guest on deck. If he doesn't show up, I'm going to do a short book reading, and then we will close out uh, today's show. But I just want to welcome you all again to the day's Off the Shelf no matter what happens, I want to give you entertainment, inspiration, motivation, and all good things that keep you going forward. But do you love mystery? Do you? I mean, I'm talking a complex mystery uh, that, that that is re- reflects things that happen in real life. A real true uh, gritty mystery. If you do, and it's something that keeps you turning the pages. It's full of action that keeps you turning the pages. If you do, I encourage you to get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom. It's a mystery and suspense book that really pulls off the combination of real-life events with this action, page-turning suspense. And just to give you a little glimpse into the story, uh, Clarissa is like one of the major characters in Escaping Toward Freedom, and she's a writer. She's vacationing. In the North Georgia mountains, if you've ever been there, they're gorgeous. And she's trying to stir up her creative juices. She wants to gain enough inspiration, just enough motivation, inspiration, insight to pen another blockbuster novel. So that's where she's gone to the mountains. This is where she was uh, a year before when she churned out a New York Times and an Essence bestseller. So she's hoping that this will happen again. And she isn't in the mountains two, four days, when she spots what looks like a girl hiding by her cabin. And she invites this girl into her her cabin that she's renting, and that single event changes her life forever. And so I encourage you to get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom. Escaping Toward Freedom, you can get a copy today, and if you don't see it on the library shelves or the bookstore shelves, just tell the clerk you want to get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom by Denise Turney. And I'm actually going to go get a, get the book as we wait for our guests to join us. I'm going to do maybe two book readings today for you um, as, a, as a treat. And if our guest doesn't join, then we will close the show out early today. So Escaping Toward Freedom, and this came out. Early this year, and I'm going to start, let's see, I'll start with the beginning, then I'm going to skip around a little bit, give you guys a little taste of what's going on in Escaping for Freedom. So in Chapter 1, a northern cardinal, its, cre- its red crest flattened by the whip of high wind, slammed into Clarissa Maxwell's large bay window. Oak and birch leaves muddled together with broken tree branches were strewn across the front and back yards. Remaining evidence of last night's storm, a noisy event that brought pounding rains and sh- and shaking Clarissa out of sleep. Sitting in an upholstered chair across from the bay window, Clarissa, a 38-year-old single woman who moved to Georgia several years ago after vacationing in the state, looked down at her laptop screen and frowned. Her brow tightened into ugly lines, pulling the ends of her cornrows behind her ears. She fell back against her dining room chair. Damn, she cursed to the spacious dining room in a luxury two-story Sandy Springs, Georgia townhouse. Two years and I still haven't published a new novel. I can't go deeper into debt, she scowled. I'm almost buried. 
Money woes were pushing her close to anxiety. She almost sighed when she heard Mary Newton's song, Who's to Blame, sound across her cell phone, demanding her attention. Normally she left the phone on mute, especially while she was working. But she turned the ringer on this morning after receiving a text from her sister, April. She was upbeat as she sang, Hey, April, what's up? Into the phone. Job stress, April laughed. You are me, Clarissa asked, staring at her laptop's empty screen. I was talking about me, April said. These six senior managers who I support are about to drive me nuts. They are so demanding, she moaned. I'm starting to feel like I can't do this job anymore. After a pause, she lowered her voice and added, I don't want to fail. The sisters are bond strong since childhood talk for 20 minutes, interrupting their upsets with laughter every few minutes. Finally, April said, let me get off this phone. I've got a butt-kicking project to knock out before morning, morning, but first I've got to get dinner on the table. What's for dinner, Clarissa asked. Spaghetti and homemade tomato sauce. Send me some, Clarissa begged. Love your homemade tomato sauce. Love you more than anything, April chuckled. You're the best sister ever, Clarissa bowed. Well, sister, treat me to your new novel. I'm telling you, April, Clarissa began glancing toward the bay window. If I don't get a new novel written soon, I'm going to be out of my home. She paused. It's probably why I've been filling out of sorts. She shook her head. i got to find something to write a novel about. I have to, she added, more volume in her voice. It's mid-July, the time when I've usually been working on a good story. But not this year, she sighed. Something's wrong. Call me if you want to talk about it, April offered. I will, Clarissa nodded, chewing her bottom lip. So I'm going to move forward. Let's see where, 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 where do I go to from here? Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go to. She's she's written her home. Let's see. And this happens really really fast. This this is just chapters. I mean, just a few pages in. I'm trying to think when she comes to con, come. Uh, uh, oh, here we go. And this is where she's going to come running into, uh, she's going to see the little girl. Okay, so I'm on page 20, so this book, this story is happening fast. I encourage you to get a copy of Escaping for Freedom. The pace is fast. You will be turning the pages. Hurrying down the stairs, she ran to the back door. This time when she looked through the door window, she swore that, that she saw what looked like a girl crouching next to her Camry that was parked at the edge of the backyard. But where she stood looking out the window, the girl looked unkempt and lost. Her curled back, the way that she folded her arms across her chest, as if protecting something delicate and valuable, revealed that she was hiding. Even from inside the cabin, Clarissa noticed that the girl was shaking. She looked slight of build, like a petite kid in her early teens. Knowing what it felt like to feel frightened, Clarissa pulled up on her gun. Then she opened the back door. Before she went to her car, she checked the other side of the cabin. The area was clear. Taking short, careful steps, Clarissa approached her car. From the way that the girl was shaking, she knew that the girl was alone. She wondered if the girl lived in the area. The girl hid behind the Camry with her arms wrapped around her torso. She was peering at the ground and trembling uncontrollably. I'm not going to hurt you, Clarissa said, extending her hand. Even as she reached for the girl, she scanned the area, looking toward the front in the back of the cabin. The girl recoiled and leaned back closer to the Camry. Her fingernails, full mouth, diamond nose stuff, and penciled eyebrows. And it further that she was beyond middle school years. Are you hungry, Clarissa Try turning and looking over her shoulder back at her cabin. Come inside. The girl pushed up as if preparing to stand. Then she knelt toward the ground again. This is my cabin, Clarissa said, taking hold of the girl's right forearm and helping her to stand. I'm renting the cabin. The girl's eyes were dark brown and full like longan. Her wide-eyed gaze darted from side to side, signaling that she expected to be attacked, struck. It's just me, Clarissa shared. I'm the only one at the cabin. The girl, her footsteps short and slow, followed Clarissa to the cabin's back porch. It's okay, Clarissa said, holding the back door open. Come on, she told the girl. It's okay. I'm not going to let anyone hurt you. How old are you, she asked after the girl followed her inside the kitchen. The girl seemed lost in a catonic stupor. She peered down at her hands, mud and dirt streaking her skin. Her eyes were held pools of tears. How old are you, Clarissa tried again, reaching in the cupboard for a drinking glass. She went to the refrigerator and poured the girl a glass of water. Sixteen, the girl whispered, gifting Clarissa with an answer in the sound of her gentle, trembling voice. She opened her hands and took a glass of water. 
this is swallowed hard. She struggled to disguise the surprise. The girl saw the parents. Are you from around here, she asked, turning and locking the door. Dread of being watched, targeted, overcame her. Before she knew it, she was closing and locking the screen kitchen windows. She walked through the entire house, closing and locking the windows. Finally, she returned to the kitchen and looked through the back door window. When she turned away from the door, she jumped. The girl was standing so close to her that if she turned any further, she would bump her. Clarissa explored the girl's downturned face. She thought that the girl had the saddest eyes she'd ever seen. Her mouth was pulled down. Her lower eyelids were darkened. She was overcome with tremors, nearly losing control of the glass, now empty of the water that she drank absent hesitation. Where are you from, Clarissa asked, looking from the girl to the empty glass. The girl lowered her head until her chin touched her chest. A second later, raising her head, she looked at the glass, yellow daisies decorating its top edge. Then after taking a breath, she bowed her head. You can put the glass in the sink, Clarissa said. The girl walked as if she was tired. After she placed the glass in the sink, she turned her back, pressed against the sink edge, and bowed her head. Would you like something to eat, a sandwich? Fruit, Clarissa asked. Yes. The girl nodded in jerky motion. She glanced up at Clarissa, and just as quickly she looked at the floor. So I'm going to go a little bit further. She's talking to her, asking her where she's from, where are you from, um, how does she get how does she get to where she is? Um and so now she's going and Chris is starting to worry about the girl. Do you know anyone around here? Clarissa asked, extending her hand. And the truth is psychological heaviness began to drape her. It was accompanied by disturbing images of Trisha hiding alone in the woods. That's the girl's name. She the girl finally told her, her name. Yards away from a hungry crouching bobcat or a snarling wolf. Although she had never seen Trisha before, was in no way indebted to her. She felt responsible for her, if for no other reason than that they were both human beings. Do you, Clarissa asked. Do you know anyone around here? No. Then stay the night, Clarissa advised. You can stay here and get a good night of rest. She searched Trisha's face, tried to calm the fear that had risen to her eyes. You'll be safe here for the night, she assured her. Come on, Clarissa said and said. Let's go upstairs and see if we can find some clothes that fit you, and you can enjoy a a nice shower, a warm, relaxing bubble bath, and settle in for a restful day and a good night's sleep. She followed Chris around the corner and up the living room stairs, being careful to peer out the living room curtains on her way to the second floor. Sensing her concern, Chris said, I pulled the blinds close enough to prevent anyone from seeing inside. Pausing, she added, if I don't close the curtains all the way, it can make the cabin stand out. Midway up the stairs, she said, most of the people out here don't even look like their windows during the day. This is a very peaceful, quiet area. Once on the second floor, Carissa went to a bedroom straight away, straight away. Pulling open dressing drawers, she dug through her shirts and pants, hunting for clothes that might fit Trisha. Finally, she looked up. Trisha stood in the hallway just outside the bedroom. She had when Clarissa and she first happened upon each other. She stood with her head bowed. For distraction, she looked at the dirt beneath her fingernails. You can come in, Clarissa said, as if frozen. Trisha didn't move, not so much as half a step. Each time that she looked at the bed, she grimaced and turned away, just shielding herself from a painful memory. Come on, Clarissa said. She stood and turned away from her dress. It's okay, she smiled. You can come in. Remember, she began, we came up here to find you something to wear after you enjoy a relaxing shower bath. Trisha backed away from Clarissa, shaking her head. She kept backpedaling, one uneven step after another. I'm not going to hurt you, Clarissa said, moving from the edge of the bedroom into the hallway. Trisha bolted down the hallway toward the stairs. Trisha, Clarissa called out. I'm not going to hurt you. She ran down the stairs after her, the heels of her. Of her shoes clomping against his step, they way through the living room, inches away from the orange cello chair. She grabbed Clarissa's left forearm, and I'm going to stop right there. And I, I'm only about 20 some pages into Escaping Toward Freedom. If you like that, the pace of the story, the mystery, and getting to know Miss Clarissa and Trisha, and there's more to come because there's more girls going to show up. I encourage you to get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom. It's an ebook print, hardback. You can get it. If you don't see it on the bookstore shelves or at the library, just tell them you want a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom by Denise Turney, and they can get you a copy. Now I'm going to do something I've never done on the show. Uh, not sure what's going on with our guests. We'll hold our guests up in prayer. But I'm going to do a second book reading, and I've never done this. Rarely have done book readings on off the shelf. Generally interview other authors because I like to support and spotlight other people. But this 
This I'm going to do from my middle school book, Rosetta, the Talent Show Queen, and the second book in the Rosetta series will be out shortly. So I'm going to just start with the beginning for Miss Rosetta. You can get to know her. She's spunky. She's courageous. And, and you're going to learn a little bit about her as I read the very beginning of Rosetta, the Talent Show Queen. Mommy, Rosetta screamed, the ends of her two thick braids blowing up. She ran through the living room waving her report card. I did it! Linda Blay, Rosetta's mother, turned away from her painting easel. The leopard painting that she was working on was coming along beautifully. What is it, she asked. I got three A's on my report card, Rosetta screamed. Linda swung, sprung from her chair. Well, now, she smiled. Looks like you're on the right track. Her face plumped with excitement. Rosetta ran around the living room corner. She raced inside her mother's art room, her report card flapping in the air. She yelled it up high. All that study and idea paid off, Rosetta Bean. She hugged her mother around the waist. Wait until Jennifer sees my report card. She kissed her mother's face, and she turned and ran out of her mother's art room. She won't be able to leave me out of all the school clubs. Keep telling everybody that I'm stupid. Rosetta, Linda tried. Don't you go showing off. It was too late. Not even two minutes passed before Rosetta plopped down on the living room sofa and picked up her cell phone. She called her best friend, Paulette. That's right, Rosetta screamed, exclaimed into her cell phone. I got three A's. I know I did almost as good as Jennifer. See, Paulette chimed. I told you all that studying that you did would pay off. Rosetta agreed. You always know what to do. Pushing you to study hard every night instead of only once a week isn't tough, Paulette laughed. I didn't do anything great. You're the one who did the hard studying. You just wait until Jennifer gets a look at my report card. Rosetta piped, circling the A's on her report card with the tips of her fingers. Forget about Jennifer, Paulette Coates. The two of you have been fighting since elementary school. I don't care if you got straight A's for the rest of the school year. Climb to the top of Mount Everest and run a mile in two minutes. Jennifer was still picking you, Paulette laughed. Jennifer just doesn't know how cool you are. Thanks, Paulette. You're my best friend for life. And you're my best friend for life, Paulette said. I love you like a sister. You and me, we're like relatives. Sisters! For sure, was that a cheer? We've been cool since day. Oh, no. Remember when we went ice skating at the rink downtown? We were so little then, Paulette said. Like five and six years old, was that a smile, glancing up at the ceiling as if recalling those memories. We had so much fun. Think we skated for a whole hour, falling down and getting back up, she laughed. On the way home, you talked your dead into pulling over and taking that injured mutt that we saw on the side of the road to the pound. I've always loved animals, Paulette. Couldn't leave that dog limping on the side of the interstate. You know that dog had a broken leg? How do you know? My dad told me, Rosetta answered, her hand going up and waving through the air. I asked him to keep on the pound. Guess what? What? That dog's kind of home in less than two weeks. Go, Rosetta! You've always rooted for the little guy, and now you're getting your grades up. Thanks, Paulette. She pulled herself on closer to her. Now, Jennifer, Rosetta continued, she always thinks that she's a lot smarter than everyone. Miss Honor Rose, she's a teacher's pet. Who cares, Paulette shrugged. You're the fun one. You crack me up sometimes. Me, Gregory, Belinda, and Anil like to have fun. Miss Jackson doesn't care, though. She never notices me or anyone else in class, Rosetta groaned. She crossed her legs. But wait until tomorrow. She piped, grinning at her report card. I'm going to class first thing in the morning and shove my report card right in Jennifer's face. The front door swung open. As it did, bits of snow blew off the porch onto the house's front entranceway, and cold air blasted into the living room. It felt like someone had turned on an ice fan. Cincinnati, Ohio's December temperatures were at record lows. Rosetta's father, Robert Blay, smiled and waved to Rosetta while he walked through the living room into the art room where Rosetta's mother was painting. What's Rosetta talking about, he asked. Linda, after he greeted her with a kiss, project demands at the marketing firm where he worked, nodded away. He was glad to be home. Linda chuckled at the question. Ten-year-old Rosetta was always up to something. It was hard for her mother to know what Rosetta was planning. Linda figured that Rosetta made plans in her sleep. One thing was certain. Rosetta Blade, two long pigtails going like fresh vine down her side of her head was no one to ignore. I don't know, Linda answered. You know how that girl is. Well, she was on her cell phone saying something about a Jennifer when I walked through the front door. He paused. Isn't that the name of the girl Rosetta got put in detention over? Remember, he said his wife. Rosetta threatened to fight that girl two months ago. He shook his head. Rosetta never got into trouble at school until that incident. He gave his wife a telling glance. I say we find out what she's up to come dinner time. And I'm going to stop there. And that's a, rather, just like maybe the first three, four, four pages of Rosetta, the talent show queen. And I encourage
encourage you to get a copy for yourself, even if you're an adult. You, uh, confession, I, I still like to read kids' books sometimes. When I'm at book shows, book festivals, if I get a, a book, a middle school or children's book to support another author, author, I will read it, and I've enjoyed them. So I encourage you, whether for yourself or a child in your life, gift it to your child, a niece, a nephew, somebody you're mentoring. Rosetta, the talent show queen. Rosetta, the talent show queen. Rosetta, the talent show queen by Denise Tiny. Ebook print, hardback. Go get yourself a copy. Go get yourself a copy and escaping toward freedom. And I want to encourage you to visit me online at Chistel, C H I S. T E L L dot com. Again, C H I S T E L L dot C H I S T E L L dot com. Chisel dot com. I want to thank you guys for tuning in today. Listen, I guess up in prayer. They did not show up this morning, but don't know why. But always, and I hope I set a good example. No matter what happens in your life, you got to keep moving forward because every day holds surprises. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. No matter what happens, keep going forward. Thank you for catching today's show. Please get a copy of Escaping Toward Freedom and Rosetta, the talent show queen. You can read free excerpts from all my books at Chistel, C-H-I-S-T-E-L-L dot com. And keep up with me by subscribing for free to my newsletter, The Book Lovers Having, which you can get again at Chistel, C H I S. T-E-L-L dot com. Tell book lovers everywhere. Visit Chistel.com and sign up for the book lovers having and listen to Off the Shelf Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you back here next Saturday. We always have something great literary storytelling on deck for you here on Off the Shelf Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. As I always tell you, and I mean this, and this is something even I have to work on daily, and I encourage you to get this in your being. It's the truth. You are amazing. You are amazing. You are amazing. You're awesome. You're incredible. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. See you back here next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bye for now.